Well, there should be an outline in front of you titled Charities, Missionaries, and Ministry. And the subtitle there is A Need for Less Money and More Workmen. Uh, this is an outgrowth of some conversations I've been having with people online, and various people have asked me about how we ought to give to charity or if or how we ought to give to missionaries. And I wanted to address this from a Pauline perspective. You know, it really irks me when I hear people say, well, we're going to do a study on the Apostle Paul, the great missionary, you know, as if that was all that he was, when actually Paul was an apostle of the Gentiles and was given a dispensation of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 9, 17. And so we really can't make uh, too much of the office that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to Paul, because without him, we would not know the manifoldism of God. We would not know the preaching of the cross as the gospel. Uh, we would not understand the church, the body of Christ. You know, we'd be stuck in Israel's program under a covenant trying to get salvation through uh, praying the Lord's Prayer. And so we have a lot to attribute to the ministry that the Lord did through Paul. And uh, this morning I want to deal with the need for more missionary activity, the need for uh, more people to get involved in doing the work. Okay? Typically what happens this time of year is that you'll get a lot of uh, mailers, a lot of brochures, a lot of appeals to donate to this or that charity, uh, to give or, or support this or that missionary. And they're trying to earn a financial backing for their ministry, for what they do. And there's a lot of big charities, a lot of good charities, a, a lot of sincere um, missionaries that see souls saved. And what, what is our place in this? We're mid-Acts, Pauline dispensational right dividers. How do we respond to these appeals for support, for giving? Now, of course, we can teach a lesson on giving and talk about how we need to be generous, and God gave us all spiritual blessings, and so we, with what we have, need to be generous to other people as well, and giving is a good thing. And so we're not talking about not giving money. Um, when I say a need for less money, what I'm trying to do here is direct our attention to how we ought to think and our motives towards giving to missionaries and or charities. Because I think there's a tendency in our society when we see a charity or see a missionary is to earn some points with God or earn some good boy points by giving what we have for what we don't want to do, which is money for ministry. Right? So we have lots of money, don't have the time or really want to do that ministry, so I pay someone else to do it. And uh, that's not really the mindset of someone who is saved by grace, who's been given the ambassadorship function by the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, 1 Timothy 6, Paul tells those who are rich in this world, he doesn't tell them initially to give money. Look at 1 Timothy 6. We'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later as well, but just to point this out, 1 Timothy 6, 17, Paul charges them that are rich in this world, which I've mentioned before, if you're looking at the world as a whole, everybody in this room uh, would be considered rich. Okay, so, well, I'm no Howard Buffett, okay, but when you have people living a whole year on $100, that means you got enough, is what that means. So meanwhile, 1 Timothy 6, 17, we do know that there's richer people than us, and there's those that are rich in the world. He says, charge them that are rich in the world, that they be not high-minded. First off, when you have wealth, you tend to think of yourself as uh, uh, being better than someone else, because I've got money, so I must be smarter than that guy. I must be better than that guy. It's just not true. Okay? Uh, Solomon says that wealth uh, doesn't come to the wise, and so sometimes wealth happens by time and chance. But meanwhile, First Timothy 6, 17, he says, They trust not in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy well, look at verse 18. So far, we've not heard Paul say anything about the rich giving their money away. Verse 18, that they do good, that they be rich in good works. So again, Paul hasn't said anything about giving their money away. He says that the rich in this world, they be rich in good works. The, the gospel of the grace of God, that you becoming an ambassador, a servant of the Lord, requires that you individually be equipped to do good works. You say, well, I'm a millionaire. I pay other people to do stuff for me. Not with this. You are an ambassador. You have to learn to do good works. And by shirking that responsibility, uh, you're shirking the only duty that you have before God, okay? which is to, to, to do that ambassadorship function. But he says that they do good, be rich in good works, and he says ready to distribute. He doesn't say give 99% of your wealth. You know, be ready to distribute. Where you see there's a need, meet it. Right? But before all that, he wants you to do something. And so that's really what we're talking about this morning, uh, trying to discern the greatest need and when you talk about ministries, when you talk about missionaries, when you talk about charities, what is the greatest need? People will say, well, we need more money. Money will fix it, right? No, that's not the greatest need in the world, okay? 
So charities and missionaries, they come to you, and what they do, they show you a slideshow, a presentation, they give you a brochure, and they tell me that if I pay $20, they can give you know, a goat to a poor person in Africa, and this will help them. because you know, they, they show me the need. This person needs a goat. That person needs a rabbit. You know, and they, they want me to give some money to help that person. They show a need. What is the greatest need in the world? You're saved by God's grace. You needed a savior, obviously. But you're looking around the world. You're, 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 you've been told and commissioned to do ministry in this world. What is the greatest need in this world? Is it education? Is it technology? Food, water, and shoes? There's charities endless that will provide for the food, uh, the necessities, for the clothes, the shelter of people who have those needs. Is that the greatest need? There's a lot of people who don't have clean water. A lot of people who don't have clothes. Okay? What about freedom, money, better politics? We just had better political systems across the world. Everyone would get wealthy. Okay, all of these things are good things. That if we had these, no doubt, there would be positive improvement in society. And yet, are they the greatest need? Of course, I kind of showed my hand a little bit in realizing, and I said before, that you needed a Savior. And that the, the problem with this world is that it's stuck in sin. And they need God. And so I would appeal to you that the greatest need is not food, water, and shoes. It's not freedom. It's not better politics. It's not money. Okay, it's not education or technology, even though those things are great. There's a great need for them. The greatest need is for tears. You say tears. Don't we have enough of those? Right? Don't we have enough people suffering? Uh, and we do. And that's the kind of tears that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the tears of people who are saved, who see the condition of the lost, and want to do something about it. Okay, not people who have a big paycheck and say, well, how many zeros do you want me to put on that? We need tears. We need people who weep. I quoted Hudson Taylor on your outline there, and I'll read to you a quote from the great missionary to China. Okay, he says, Perhaps if there are more of the intense distress for souls that leads to tears, we should more frequently see the results we desire. The problem is we complain so much about how society's not Christian anymore and that we're losing a hold on the culture and you know people aren't getting saved. There's wrong doctrine everywhere. You know what we need? We need more passion. We need more tears. We need more sweat and blood. Some work to be done. Well, I'll give you a hundred bucks. I need you to do work. That's what we need. Tears. We, I want you, the Bible needs you, to think about the condition, the need in the world and say, I'm going to weep over that. That's horrible. Someone ought to do something. And you're someone to do something. Hudson Taylor says, Sometimes it may be that while we are complaining of the hardness of the hearts of those who we're ministering to, we're seeking to benefit, the hardness of our own hearts and our feeble apprehension of the solemn reality of eternal things may be the true cause of our want of success. The reason why people don't succeed in ministry, the reason why ministries aren't having the effect that needs to have an effect, because people pay other people to do ministry for them. We have a mercenary mindset. Nobody weeps anymore for the lost. Nobody has passion for them anymore. A charity comes and asks them for money, and they go, this is kind of uncomfortable. I see that starving child. Take some money. Go away. And we pay them to go away. Why don't you do something? I just gave them money. No, do something. Money pays for administrative things. Money pays for them to come to your door and give you the postcard. You know what's better than money is a person doing work. Okay. And that's what we see throughout the scripture. Look at 2 Corinthians 2, verse 4. Paul wept. Every epistle Paul wrote were to churches that he founded. And he founded on tears, folks. Why did he go to Corinth? Why did he go to, to Rome in, in chains? Why was he stoned thrice? Because he had an intense desire that he would see them saved. He didn't just, yeah, I, they need to be saved. That's God's will. I know God's will now. He had a desire. That's something else. There's something inside him that said, this needs to happen, and I know it, and I have the hands and the mouth to do it. I'm going to do it. And of course, Paul, more than us, he was given a dispensation of the Lord. It was necessary for him to do it. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, he says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, Paul writes to the Corinthians because of the anguish of his heart. He rebukes them in 16 chapters in 1 Corinthians. Rebukes them. Why would he do that? Because he's proud and arrogant. He thinks he's always right. That's what the world would have you think. He wrote 1 Corinthians in tears because he wants to see these people do right, mature in the faith, and grow to the point that they're able also to teach people and have the anguish of heart, to have the, the sorrow in themselves, the heaviness of the burden to minister to people. 
Romans chapter 9, verse 2, Paul says, I have a continual heaviness and sorrow in my heart. Well, Paul, didn't you say to join the Lord always? And again, I say rejoice. Yeah, he did. We join the Lord, and then we see the world, we weep, and we need to do work. Okay? Paul wrote with anguish of heart. He wrote with many tears. Not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. Sound doctrine cannot teach you love. Okay, we can talk about dispensational charts and rightly dividing Peter from Paul, and it will not give you the anguish of heart that you need to do ministry work. That comes from you, inner man. It comes from you considering and contemplating and not pushing out of your mind the need for ministry, but instead saying, I've been given a ministry. There's a great need looking right in the face and crying over it, saying it needs to be done, and I'm the only one that can do it. That's a feeling you should not discard. Don't try to convince yourself there's someone else that'll do it. You are the one that God has called to do it. Okay? Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 19. Paul goes to Ephesus in Acts 20, and he's going to leave them after ministering for years among them. So no doubt he had some friends. He saw people saved in Ephesus. He gives them Pauline doctrine. He's seeing them mature in the faith. He's seeing them edify one another, and he's seeing teachers come out of Ephesus. And so he was a teacher of them, and now they're becoming teachers. And what a great... A great pattern we see there. But Acts 20, verse 19, Paul says, if you look at verse 18, When they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears. See that? Tears are part of Paul's ministry. Why was he crying? Because he wants to see them grow. This, this is his motivation. Is he says, look, there's a need in Ephesus. There's false gods there. Remember the book of Acts? He goes there and he, 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 he almost destroys the witchcraft business. right? He weeps over the city and says, i got work to do. And he does it. And what results from it is the church in Ephesus. He says, remember when I ministered unto you in all these seasons with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews? How I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house? His tears motivate him to do the work in Acts 20, verse 20, from house to house, teaching people until he was able to get an assembly together where people would come together and he could teach teachers to be teachers. Look at Acts 20, verse 30. Paul says, Also of your own selves shall men arise. Uh, well, that's not the verse I need. Verse 31 is what I need. He says, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Imagine Paul, the crying apostle, you know. He's just, why is he crying all the time? It's his passion. It's an outflow of his passion. Parents understand this. They cry for their children. Why? You love them so much. You want to see them do well. You don't want to see them fail. You don't want to see... You, that's the crying that he's doing here. As a father does his children, as a mother does his children, he's weeping. Okay, he says, with tears I minister unto you. Look at Romans chapter 9, verse 10, 2, which I quoted to you before. Paul says about his kinsman in the flesh, he's an Israelite. And so he had a continual heaviness and sorrow in his heart for the Jews, for Israel. Okay? You need to have this in front of your eyes. What do we do about all the unsaved in the world? Consider them. Consider their end. <clears throat> Think about it. All right? Make the tears flow. Maybe you'll do something about it. Okay? That's where the motivation for ministry comes from. Romans chapter 10, verse 1, Paul says, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. His heart's desire. 1 Timothy 3, verse 1, Paul says, in this dispensation, he teaches the doctrine that God does not ordain a priest anymore. There was a time where God said, if you're a Levite, you're, you're part of the priest class. And if you're of the tribe of Aaron, or of the sons of Aaron, you're part of the priests that minister in the temple and sacrifices. Okay, that's by birthright you have this. You don't have anything by birthright in this dispensation. You've been given all things by grace. And you know what? You haven't been told to do anything except be a saint a member of the body of Christ and yet if you desire the office of a bishop to teach and to edify and to see other people grow you desire a good thing is what Paul says not everyone has to be a bishop but it has, it has to do with desire the dispensation of grace one of the characteristics of our service is, an, is the outflow of our desire that's how we serve that's how we give that's how we do anything because we don't have to do anything but why do we do it? It's the desire in our heart. It's right to do. It's, there's a need to do it. Okay? Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Turn there in your Bible. When it comes to missionaries, when it comes to charities, there's a tendency for rich Christians 
that would be those of us in America and other wealthy countries, uh, to turn our missionaries into mercenaries, which is, means we're paying them to do our service, the work that we need to do. Yesterday I wrote about the missionary, some missionaries that I support, and I said that tongue-in-cheek, uh, don't call themselves missionaries, but they are. Because they tell me that there's no grace group where I live, but I'm handing out your tracts and I'm talking to people about the gospel. That's missionary activity. They're in a place, just this, this, last night I got an email from someone in Fiji. Fiji! I don't, I've never been to Fiji. It's a long ways away. And he goes, there's no grace group out here, but I love your stuff and I'm trying to teach it to people. That's missionary activity. When you're surrounded by people who are not like-minded and you know the truth, you're the missionary. The mission you've been given is from the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no need to wait around and wait for some supernatural call of the Lord. He's told you to do the work already. And that's what it is. You become a missionary. You say, well, I don't want to be a missionary. You are. <laughs> that's your most important service, okay, whether you like it or not. We all have different aptitudes and different abilities and skills, but God has made you and equipped you with his word to do that work of an evangelist. So the temptation, again, is when we're approached, by missionaries to say, oh, here's the guy that evangelizes. There's the evangelist. He does that work. I'm just the guy in the pew that provides the money. Money is a good thing. Being generous is a good thing. With the right heart, it's a good thing. But I fear that a lot of people do it just so they won't have to cry over people anymore. They pay the money so they won't have to get invested in it. Okay? They, they won't have to spend and be spent in their life with it. They can just pay off the excess and someone else now can do it for them. It's mercenary. And someone using someone else's money will never do the work as hard as if it were their own. You know that truth in business, don't you? It's the same thing with missionary activity. Okay, More than money is your time, is you're doing the work. A lot of evangelism, a lot of teaching and preaching that we do, even though it, it sometimes requires materials in the back, it charts, papers, tracts, that sort of thing, it doesn't need those things. You read the Bible, it's in your brain, and suddenly... You can talk to somebody. That's all that it needs. We don't need a TV. We don't need a satellite dish. We don't need a big publishing company. We need people with mouths speaking to other people the truth and love. Okay? You know, paying people to do your service weakens your character and theirs. I say theirs, as I mentioned earlier this morning, uh, when you pay these young people who want to be a missionary, and typically that's because they like to travel and and adults tell them, travel while you're young, and you'll have the opportunity. And so, well, I'll travel. We're a missionary organization. And they get sent across the world to these different lands. And their parents think, well, this is a good thing. Maybe they'll learn something about serving the Lord. And yet they don't learn anything because they're the ones supposed to be teaching other people. But they're not equipped. When you pay someone else to do your service, it weakens their character. They don't learn what it means to work. They don't learn what it means to suffer need, as Paul did. And your character as well, because now suddenly you think you're no longer obligated to do the ministry because we're paying a missionary to do it. Right? Well, newsflash, you're still a minister. Okay? Hudson Taylor will go back to what he says in his advice. He says, To pay young converts, however sincere for making known the gospel, and to pay them with money from foreign sources must inevitably weaken their influence, if not their Christian character. This is from one of the greatest Christian ministries to China. Okay? who not only paid his way over there, but he did work while he was over there. He came back to London years later and was trying to uh, tell people about his work in China. He, the only reason why he came back to London was because his wife was sick, else he would never came back. Um, and he came back and he tried to convince people that, hey, there's a missionary over there, there's lots of unsaved people over there trying to get people to weep over the unsaved souls in China. And one of the pastors said, before you leave, we want to take up a donation because, you know, I think people will be touched by what you say and and they'll give some money to your work. He says, oh, no, no, no. I don't want them to be relieved of the burden that I preach just by getting a few dollars into the plate. Do not take a collection for me. Okay? And he's, why not? He goes, because souls are not saved with money. They're saved by people who preach the gospel to them, and he wants people to go back to China with him. That's what he says. He was trying to get people to do the work by feeling the burden. And when people preach the need for unsaved souls to be saved, we often relieve ourselves of the burden by saying, well, we'll just give some money. Okay. And this is what happens. This is what missionaries feed on. I'm not trying to, to disparage missionaries, a lot of sincere ones out there, and charities, a lot of sincere charities out there. But we need to be careful of the motive of our own heart, of why we're giving. Okay. If you see that this is a good charity, this is a good person to support in ministry, then do so. But do it out of your excess, and then determine, I still got my own work to do. 
because I have this money, I'm going to be ready to distribute to that work because I think that's good too. Right? It does not replace your service for the Lord by paying someone else to do theirs. Okay? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, we learn that hard work creates godly character. It's the Pauline pattern too, by the way. Hudson Taylor paid his own way to China. He's just one example. Adam Ivor Judson did the same thing. Many other missionaries of the 19th century who are the greats, they paid their own way. They, they were dropped in a foreign land and said, survive. <laughs> and they did, because of a heart's desire. You know, it takes a lot of conviction to suffer that kind of need. Well, I can't go to a foreign country. I can't go across the street. I don't have the money and all the resources. I don't, you, you see the fear? It takes a lot of courage to say, who cares? About I can live there, I can live here. Either way, I've got to live somewhere. And they go there and they provide. Ephesians 4.28, Paul says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather uh, let him labor, working with his hands, a thing which is good, that he may have to give to them that need it. The Jews have a saying about their rabbis. All the Jewish rabbis have a skill. Okay? They're, they're not just taught to teach in the, in the synagogues. They all have a skill. And the saying is that if you don't teach your son a skill, you taught him to be a thief. Because he can't provide for himself. I think that's what we, we've done in Christian ministry today. We've raised up a, a group of people to be pastors and teachers and missionaries that have no other skill. And so they depend upon money from other people. And you get people right doctrine who are in these positions. You tell a pastor, you tell a youth leader, you tell a missionary, right doctrine, they go, well, I can't stop what I'm doing because how would I support my family? They have no skills. And so they take money from other people and teach wrong doctrine because they're stuck in an occupation they have no other skills to do. You know, this is a bad situation. So again, Paul, the Paul's example to provide for your own, 1 Timothy 5, verse 18, would solve a lot of problems, I think. People follow the Pauline pattern. You know, Paul was a missionary. Paul was not a pastor in every church that he went into. He traveled around. He traveled Ephesus, Corinth, Rome, Philippi. He started these churches. And everywhere he went, he provided for himself. It's interesting. 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, Paul says... If you don't provide for your family, provide for your own. You're worse than an infidel. Then he provide not for his own, especially those of his own house. He hath denied the faith. It's worse than an infidel. So that means, apparently, if you don't take responsibility to provide for your own and for your own house, you're taking what God has told you to do and saying, nope, I don't believe that. I believe God will supply all my needs. Isn't that what happens? Give us this day our daily bread. They sit at the table. God will provide. Churches take a leap of faith, take a huge mortgage to buy their new church building. God will provide the money. You're denying the faith. You're denying what God is doing today. He's not doing that. He's told you, you better provide for yourself or you're going to be up the creek. That's what he says. His grace is sufficient. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11. Paul says to be quiet, to work with your own hands. Study to be quiet, to do your own business, to work with your own hands. What are you studying? To do your own business. <laughs> Study to be quiet, do your own business, to work with your own hands, as we commanded you, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without. You know, the biggest shame on American Christianity today is money. It's pastors who preach wrongly the curse of law tithing. And the secular world sees that, and they say, all pastors talk about is money. All churches want money, money, money. Missionaries, money, money, money. Charity, money. That's all they want. And so you see charities now started by unbelieving people who realize the shame of Christian ministries now. And they say, well, our charity is going to be different. 100% of your donation will go towards the actual poor person. And all the private expenses are paid for them by themselves or private donors. That's integrity is what that is. By unsaved people. What a shame. And Christian ministries say, well, workman's worthy of his hire. Law of tithing. I am God's man. What a shame. Paul worked day and night that he would not be blameworthy for that very reason. That was the Pauline pattern. And Paul tells people to do the same thing. That you might walk honestly towards them or without, that you may have lack of nothing. If pastors stopped asking for money, a lot of them would have lack of a lot of things. Okay? So we see a problem here. And again, this is directed towards us who are grace believers, members of the body, not directed towards professional missionaries, per se, or those who run charities, both good activities to do. It's more of a message here about our handling of the things that we have, being rich Christians, I think. What do we do with those things? And does it take away our obligation to serve? 
You know, under the law program, religious service was required by all people. But it was done only by a few paid priests. That was the law system. And that's where Christianity today, thinking it's underneath the law, gets their pattern. Under the law system, everybody was required to offer sacrifices and offerings, at least pay for them, right? They, they did the tithes, okay? And they brought them to the temple. And then there were some people, a few people, that God chose, the Levites and the Aaronic priests, to, to, to be in the temple, and they actually did the service. And so everyone else didn't have to do all the service work and all the rituals. They just showed up, and they paid their money, and paid their vegetables and their cows and stuff. And then the priests, they offered the sacrifices. They did the songs and they did all. That's exactly the pattern of the church today, isn't it not? People show up, I bring my wallet, you bring the service. See you at church service. What service? Where's the altar? It's up here where the pastor's at, right? I'm doing the service, you're out there providing money. That's the pattern, but that's not the Pauline pattern. That's the law pattern, that's Israel's pattern. Under grace, service is requested, not required. It's requested of all because you're saved and ordained on two good works that you should do them. And you know what? It's done out of the purpose of your heart. There's no more service class. There's no more priest class that does the service for you. So a missionary comes and says, I'm God's man. I've got a special call in my life. I've been anointed of God to mission, to, to, I heard a call from the Lord to preach to Swaziland. You, know. you heard about the, the missionary in Swayze that said that? You haven't heard that? You guys haven't been around here very long, apparently. I know the history of Swayze and their missionary activities. There was a fellow that lived near here that said he had a vision of the Lord. He saw a triangle in the sky. God was telling him to minister to Swaziland. So he moved out here to Swayze. This Swayze. He started ministering. The only Swayze in the world. And then later he got another vision from the Lord and said, Oh, God wasn't mistaken. He meant Swaziland. So he moved his ministry to Africa where Swaziland's at. You know, over the over ocean there. It was much more successful. It's hard, it's hard to start a ministry out here in Swayze, Indiana. But anyway, God's not calling people that way. He's not giving people visions. That's a true story, by the way. I got a video or uh, cassette tape at home about that. It's his, it's his cassette tape. Under grace, service is requested, requested of everybody, and it's done out of the purpose of your heart. You know, under the law, it was required to give the tithes. It didn't matter if you'd like to or not. You had to give a tenth. Right? If you didn't, you're breaking the law. That's a sin. You got a sacrifice for that. Under grace, there's no requirement for you to serve at all. Even though you should do good works, it's the right thing to do. And you need to be motivated out of the purpose of your heart to do good. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, the verse we post in the box in the back... <clears throat> is that you're not required, not a necessity to give. It's out of the purpose of your heart. Because it comes from your heart's desire to participate in service or not. Not a requirement. I'm not a priest. If you do ministry, I'd rather the box be empty and you do ministry on your own. Do the work. Because I want to see your heart purpose. I want to see your heart's desire. I want to see you weep for the, the condition of unsaved humanity and actually get something done. Let's do some work. But rich Christians have a bad habit of replacing the purpose in their heart with payment. Well, that takes a lot of effort and a lot of sorrow and anguish. And, and you know, I just don't want to be faithful. I've got a lot of things in life to deal with. So I'll make a payment, another bill, I can handle that. And suddenly I don't have to purpose in my heart. I think it was Dwight Moody. I don't know for sure. Maybe you can correct me. Someone. It's a good saying. It says, it's better to have ten men doing the job of one than one man doing the job of ten. And in Christianity, what they do now is 100 people pay one person to do the job for all of them. You have super Christians, celebrity Christians. Right? These, these are the great Christians in America. Right? Who are the greatest pastors and teachers? The ones you see on the radio, the ones you see on TV. You get lots of money. Why? Because they do a great service for the Lord. Billy Graham had his 95, 95th birth, birthday this last week. Right? The governor stands up and says, look what you've done for us. You know? He did what any minister should do. I'm not trying to diminish any good work that he did do, even though the gospel Billy Graham taught for so many years was suspect. But nonetheless, what? why aren't everybody doing that? Why isn't everybody participating? Better to have ten men doing the job of one. That, by the way, is the function of an assembly. The reason why we come here together is, is not so that one person can minister to the rest of you. It's so that all of us can encourage each other to grow to the point that you can all, we can all do the, the work of one person. That's all you have to do. You don't have to do all the work. Okay? It's impossible for you to do all the work. God wants you to do the work of one person. Provide for your family. Study to show yourself approved. Do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of one man. That's a complete life right there. Okay? What people do is say, well, provide for my family. Give to the church. That's it. They leave off their own ministry because I'm paying someone else to do that. Okay? So, 
the, the goal here is to teach us all to do the work of one person. Become a complete person in Christ. An assembly is not for raising funds. It's not for providing worship for you. It's not for doing service for you, but creating servants. Right? And so it, we're about encouraging each other, creating in ourselves the heart's desire to see the need, the greatest need, which is what? For tears. For purpose in our heart. For motivation to do right. For creating servants. Where Paul says in every one of his epistles, I'm an apostle, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He felt himself bound. You know, you're under grace, Paul. There's no law. You're not required to do anything. He felt bound by his own heart's purpose and desire, realizing the truth, the sincerity of what God was giving to people and how people were just dying left and right, rejecting it. He said, I'm a servant. That's why I'm doing this work. That's why I'm writing these letters. Some problems are not solved with money. I don't know if you read the article this last week. You know, this, this last couple of weeks, I think, is... Um, Persecuted Christian Week or something like that, where people pray for the persecuted church around the world. And uh, if you can find a place in the world that is the most persecuted, where would you say that would be? Probably North Korea. <laughs> North Korea. You'll say, well, China's pretty bad. Well, you can still be a Christian in China. North Korea, if they see you with a Bible, they'll throw you in one of their jails. It may kill you. It's illegal. And so, North Korea is one of the most oppressed countries in the world. And so, for the last two weeks, there's been an appeal by missionary organizations for churches in America to pray for these persecuted Christians, you know. And what really caught my attention was this article by a ministry in South Korea. Now, if, you, if you've ever seen the difference between South and North Korea, you can, you can see it at night when you see a picture of the globe at night. There's, there's North and South Korea are different between night and day because South Korea has all these lights, city lights, right? And right on the border is a black line and it's totally dark in North Korea. Hardly any lights up there. Big difference economically. Big difference religiously. Ever since North and South Korea split, South Korea has grown exponentially, financially, and religiously. I say religiously carefully. Okay. South Korea is the home of the largest church in the world. You know this. There's a church that has over a million people in South Korea. Huge. Lots of Christians in South Korea, at least according to the numbers. Right? Now, here are these North Koreans, and the, the title of this article by... President, uh, co-founder Eric Foley of a ministry in South Korea who is trying to minister to the North Koreans. You know, we got to help these North Korean Christians they are being persecuted. The title is North Korean Christians Pray for Free Christians to Realize God is All You Need. These North Koreans are praying for the South Korean. They're the ones saying, look, you guys need the help. They see the faith in South Korea as being tied to the prosperity gospel of not trusting on the Lord but instead trusting on circumstances. And they're going... That ain't what we're seeing in, in, in the Bible. That's not what we're learning about God from our experience. A lot of the rich Christians never suffer need. They never feel the desire in their heart to do the Lord's work, the purpose in their heart to see the soul saved. In North Korea, they have the life and death choice every day. Either I'm going to give up my faith, not do anything, or I'm going to risk being killed and do something. And over and over again, they risk and be killed. One of the first things Eric Foley, co-founder of Seoul USA, learned about North Korean underground church is that it is not a group to be pitied. About 10 years ago, Foley asked a member of the underground church how he could pray for them. He said, how can I pray for you up there? He recalls the response. He said, you pray for us? We pray for you. Because South Korean and American churches believe challenges in the Christian faith are solved by money, freedom, and politics. It's only when all you have is God do you realize God is all you need. Whoa, I thought we can help these North Koreans. I mean, we can conquer them politically. We can, you know, shoot some bombs or go in there and pull them out. They said, we don't want to go. He says, we've learned that God is all we need because everything else has been taken away from us. Wow. That we would have that heart's desire. Wow, what a lesson that teaches. He says, he estimates there's about 100,000 Christians living in North Korea with about a third of them in concentration camps. Unlike the Chinese church, North Korean Christians can't risk gathering together because spies are everywhere. Instead, they worship in their own houses or in common areas while talk, or while walking down the road out of earshot. That's how they do ministry. And they do it anyway. To learn more about the Bible, Christians who are able to leave the country, you know, Bibles are forbidden, forbidden in North Korea. He says, Christians are able to leave the country on work trips, meet with missionaries, and memorize scripture to share with others when they go back. They memorize and go back and say, this is what I memorized. Wow. There's a whole shelf of Bibles on the back there. Whole shelf of them. You've got five Bibles tucked in dust at your house. 
You know, people realize that and say, well, there's a need here. So people have tied Bibles to balloons, sent the balloons over the border, and they'd pop the balloons, the Bibles fall down in North Korea. Gotta do something, right? And people like, gotta do something. And North Koreans say, we're just memorizing scripture. You know, wow. He says physical copies of the Bible are rare for poor households as government officials regularly check their homes. If officials find a Bible, the government will send the family to concentration camps or kill them. So, our president, he's not Christian. Homosexual marriage is taking over our country. These people can't hold a Bible in their hands lest they be shot. And they say, we're praying for you American Christians. You have so much stuff and so much distraction from God, you don't realize that God's all you need. You don't have the harsh desire to say, I will give up all that I have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you you're so comfortable with what you got. Wow. What a lesson to learn there. When charities and missionaries come to you and they say, we need this much money to survive as a missionary. To do what, exactly? You have a work to do. They have, we all have a ministry to do. Let's get involved to do the work, to say the words, to speak it, to do ministry ourselves. It's not money that we need. It's not freedom. It's not the politics that we need to do the ministry. Christians are so bound to fighting for the politics of our nation. And it's good to have good politics. It's good to, to do what's biblically correct. It's good to fight a good battle. But you know what? That's not the end all be all. We can have the worst dictator in our country. And if you're not prepared to continue in the ministry of the Lord, you're not ready. Okay, that's where we need to be. Do we resist evil? Yes, we do. We learned that in Romans 13. Do we fight for, stand for liberty? Yes, we do. But you know what? It's not required to do your ministry. God's word is required. A heart is required. Tears are required to do ministry. With a zero tolerance policy for Christianity, Christians are careful who they tell about their faith. They don't reveal their belief to their spouses until years after marriage. You know how many books on marriage counseling you have in America? These people get married, don't tell their spouse that they're a Christian until years after they've you know, got a connection and trust the person. Then they say, you know what? I'm a Christian. <laughs> oh. You're risking our family. I know. Let me tell you about it. And they can't tell their children until they turn 15 because teachers in the schools are trying to extract such information from students. So their kids grow up, not knowing anything about Christianity. They get 15, so they're out of the school, and they say, well, son, I've got something to tell you. The fervor, the patience, the desire, the zeal that they have to do like this, live under these conditions, fully found that children of Christian families don't even realize they're sitting in an underground church meeting. One man said every week his grandfather would gather the family together and give them the same 10 pieces of advice piece of advice. Later he realized his grandfather was passing down the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Didn't even know it. There's no sign in the front that says, Welcome to the first church in North Korea. It's not this. We're going to have a missionary this week to South Korea. You know, everyone get out their front. There's none of this. They realize the, the necessity of God in their everyday life because they face per such persecution. Would we would pray for such persecution? <laughs> and yet we don't. We pray that God would take it away. Right? Members of the church have told Foley there at sea concentration camps as just another mission field. North Korean officials have had to separate Christians from other prisoners because they keep sharing the gospel. For, faced with such danger, North Korean defectors are often disappointed when they see the South Korean church. The largest church in the world! They're disappointed when they leave North Korea and go, this is what you guys are doing? Ridiculous. It says, I was thrown in a concentration camp under penalty of death. I was sharing the gospel with my prisoner inmates. And you guys are praying that God increase your salary a few pennies? That you know, he would bless you with comfort this Sunday? You know, what is this? You know, we, it, was, it was expected that every day be the worst day ever in North Korea. And they said, we're fine with that because God is all we need. God's grace is sufficient. Wow. The mercenary mind in America. There's a work of the ministry. It's the duty of every Christian. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14 and 15 Paul says that Christ died for all, then we're all dead, that we which live should henceforth live unto him that died for us. All right. we have, we've been bought with a price. You say, well, should I give that charity? Should I give this missionary? I think you should give. You should be generous. You got money, you see a need to, to give for it, then you decide purpose in your heart and you give it. But you know what? You have a ministry to do too. And if you have a ministry to do and it takes some money, put money into that. You know. Do your own ministry as well. Because you have been bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 6, 6.20. And you owe the Lord that. Okay? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. 
Paul says that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. We've been dealing with this verse the last couple of weeks. <clears throat> he says, All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. He's given all of us that. That's not Grace Ambassadors Bible Fellowship. That's every member of the body is a potential minister, a potential, can I say, missionary to the people that are around them to preach the message of reconciliation, to be Christ, uh, preach Christ and crucified, to be that member of Christ's body where you're at in the world. Okay, If we had 10 people doing the work of one man, it'd be like a, a church of a thousand. Church of a thousand doing that much work. Because you don't see that in churches. Churches is a gathering place where Christians come and you have, a, you have a worship team, a service team up here. But imagine, what if everybody is being equipped to do good works and we went out and we could not resist but do them? And not just good works, but the kind that God ordained should be done. You know, ministry work. 1 Corinthians 3.13 We've been talking about judgment here and there in the last few weeks as well. In Romans 14, we're all held accountable to the Lord. Every man is held accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 3.13, says, Every man's work shall be made manifest. You will appear before the Lord in judgment, and praise the Lord, your sins have been forgiven. Praise the Lord, you have eternal life if you've trusted the gospel of grace. You have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and you're going to be standing before your commander-in-chief, your head of the body, and he's going to say, Well, what good did you do in my body? What, what, how were you as an ambassador? What sort of work did you do? And every man's work shall be made manifest. You can't say, well, I was a part of another ministry. I donated to that guy. I supported him. You know, well, what, what work did you do? I made a lot of money and I gave it to that guy. You know, what work did you do? You had time, didn't you? And so there's members of the body and every man is accountable to the Lord. This should be a burden on you. And I'm not talking here about the curse of the law. You know, sometimes people write me and they say, I feel like when I read Paul's epistles sometimes, some things that he says... I feel some guilt because I'm not doing what I should. Well, if it's guilt that you're going to hell and you don't understand the gospel. But there should be some burden. There should be some responsibility. And that's not guilty that you've done something wrong. That's responsibility you're feeling. The same responsibility you feel when you have a child. I've got to feed this person. It's responsibility. It's duty. <laughs> something that must be done. See, and that is something you should feel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. This is our mission. The ministry of reconciliation. First Corinthians 13, 13. He says, And now abides faith, hope, and charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Our mission to see souls saved and saints edified is to teach the faith, which means you need to know it first, is to preach the hope to those that suffer. You know, preaching encourages them, gives them a heart's desire and hope to look forward to that. And it's to have charity, to show charity to people. You say, well, charity's come to my door. Red Cross asked me the other day to donate some money. You know, I, I sponsor five children. I save the children. You know, Good things. But what is this talking about? Charity. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse... Three, <clears throat> though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profits me nothing. Apparently, the biblical definition of charity is not you giving all of your goods to the poor. You know, you'll hear Christians today who say, doesn't the Bible, doesn't Jesus tell you to give to the poor? Yeah, we ought to help the poor, help those that have need. And yet charity, according to 1 Corinthians 13, is something a little different than that. Because apparently someone can give all their goods to the poor and still not have charity. Well, you would think that Bill Gates is the most charitable person in the world. He gives billions of dollars away. right? You would think if someone gave their own body to be burned, that'd be pretty charitable. So what is charity? Charity is love that works, that does ministry to see other people come to a knowledge of the truth. And you can give all of your goods to feed all the poor in the world. If they do not know the truth, your work is in vain. Wow, that's a hard thing. Suddenly, all the charities that are coming asking you for money, you're reevaluating now. What is the greatest need in the world? Well, if everyone just had clean water. Yes, we need clean water. 
You know what the greatest need in the world is? That we have people who do ministry work. See people saved and come to knowledge of the truth. If they die without salvation, that clean water didn't help them at all. You see, they need clean water and then the gospel. That's what they need. And so 1 Corinthians 13, verse 6, Charity rejoices not in iniquity. Charity rejoices in the truth. Charity bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Charity is not legible. Charity in you is you knowing the truth and suddenly suffering long, envying not, not being puffed up, not seeking your own, not easily provoked. The, the doctrine in you works effectually to do some work. It creates a desire in you. You see the need, the greatest need, which is beyond just helping the poor. You know, that's a good thing. It's beyond just, you know, this person's over there building shelters for people who don't have it. That's a good thing. But it's beyond that. There's a greater need than this. And you have been called to do this, ambassadors for the Lord. There are a lot of philanthropists in the world, a lot of them, a lot of rich philanthropists, a lot of them richer than you. Red Cross, these, these charitable organizations, they get lots of money. But there's not very many mid-act dispensationalists. Not very many, folks. Not many that can rightly divide. There's not many that know the clear presentation of the gospel. Matthew 25 Ministries, one of the largest Christian charitable organizations, they don't know the gospel. Matthew 25, you say. They think the gospel is helping the poor. That's not the gospel. That's not how these people say. You have the tools to get people saved by preaching the gospel of the grace of God. You know how to discern one book from another in the Bible. You can teach people. So there's not very many men acts of sensationalists. We need you. We don't need a rich philanthropist. We need you. We need you equipped. We need you to put your oar in the water. People are trying to help those who have need, and we ought to do that. We ought to be generous and gracious and, and uh, considering helping those. But you know what? You have a different perspective than a lot of the world. You're a minority. We all have complained we're so small. That's because you're so special. <laughs> That's what your mom said, right? But it's true. There's not many people who understand how to write the way of the Bible. We're trying to equip people here. I'm not trying to puff you up. We're trying to equip you so that you are uniquely skilled and qualified to do a work that no other Christian ministry is able to do because they don't rightly divide the word truth. And we need folks like you. Here comes a missionary. I'm doing a missionary work here or there. Will you support me? My first question is, what gospel do you preach? What doctrine do you know? I'm not going to give my dollar to you teaching stuff I would not utter here to you guys. If they're teaching right doctrine, then we'll talk. Right? And so that, that's the, now the evaluation. Because you have a responsibility over your own money now. That could be going to your own ministry, teaching right doctrine, which you're able to do here. And here comes some missionary saying, I want your money to do what I do there. What do you do there? If they're doing right, they're teaching the right doctrine with the right heart and the right message, let's give them money. Let's help them do their work and then do our work also. But if they're not, we need to be really careful on what ministries we're supporting and what charities we're endorsing, right? Would we have billions of dollars to preach mid act dispensationalism? But we don't. But we have people, some people, and people are more effective, more productive than money a lot of times. So if you're going to make the boat sail right, here's my bad analogy. You have a boat and it's trying to go in the right direction and you have everybody donating these big charities, these big Christian ministry organizations. Put your oar in the water. You need to also be generous and donate. But you know what? Put it on the side of the boat where there's less oars. <laughs> be careful with the, with the money that you have. An extra $10, an extra $100, an extra $1,000 donated to the Red Cross won't make as much difference than an extra $1,000 put into ministering by rightly divided. And I'm not talking about giving it to various ambassadors. I'm talking about your own ministry. Okay, we don't need it here. Right? People, people ask me. They think we're a huge place. They see our website. They go, well, you guys have got it going. And they ask me to help them get started. And I'm like, well, get it started. Do the work. You know, if you show me you're doing the work, I'll help you out with what I got too. But you know what? You can do it where you're at. You can start your own Bible study. You can talk to your family. You can talk to your friends. We're not very big. Neither are we. That's the point. Do the work. Okay? It's got to start somewhere. And it should start with you. Ministry work starts with right doctrine and flows from a right heart. Look at Ephesians 4.14. We're, we, we're so emphasized right doctrine because without right doctrine you get it all wrong. And so we try to study to show ourselves approved. We try to be gentle and apt to teach. We try to encourage others to grow as Ephesians 4 teaches us to do. But you know, just learning the doctrine, putting it in our heads is not what God, it's not all of what God has told us to do. Ephesians 4 verse 
verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And so once you've learned some doctrine, once you've matured from being a child in the faith, to being an adult in the faith, understanding right doctrine, now you're able as an adult to speak the truth. But it says in love there, there should be a heart desire in the way you speak it, right? To see this work in other people so they can grow up into Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. Every joint supplies something. The ministry today is requested of all people done on the purpose of their own heart. We're trying to engender purpose in your hearts this morning to you purpose in your own life to do this ministry. We need people making commitment for the one life they have for the most eternal, important purpose that there is. That's what we need. So Ephesians 4.15 it starts with right doctrine, but it doesn't end with right doctrine. It should flow from that a desire and a purpose to do right, to do ministry work, to do missionary work. And a missionary is not the same as traveling the world for Jesus Christ. I mentioned before, there's lots of people. The biggest problem we have in the Grace Movement is there's not enough Grace Assemblies. <laughs> Hundreds of emails I get. They say, well, there's not one in my area. Is there a Grace Group in my area? Is there a Grace Group in my area? You know, Sorry, I don't know of any. And I get these from lots of people, which tell me there's lots of people that are learning right doctrine, and they're scattered here and there. You know what that looks like to me? A map of potential Grace Assemblies. People to, to lay down a flag and say, we're starting something here. Is there one in my area? Yeah, you just emailed me. I'm putting you on my grace map is what I tell them. Right? There, flag right there. Fiji. You start something there. So a missionary is not just, hey, I need to travel outside the country. You know, other people need to hear about Jesus. Well, that's true. We need to do that. And we need more people in those places in the world who don't even know what the Christian denomination is to go out and minister to them who God is, the one true God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and their salvation. We need that ministry happening to deliver them from the, the clutches of Roman Catholicism and works-based salvation like in South America, to tell them the truth about salvation by grace to the Muslim countries because they're in a system of works like the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. We need that. But you know what? You live in a country of people who either are ignorant of the truth or don't know the truth. There's a Baptist and a Methodist and a Presbyterian and a Pentecostal right down the road, and you know what? They're not mid dispensationalists. And they struggle with the Bible rightly divided. If they're saved at all, and they may be saved, maybe some that are saved despite their teaching. But there's a missionary work that needs to be done. We need to start grace groups. We need to get the word out there. Marcus asked me between the meetings, why aren't there more people that know? We need more mouths to speak it. Okay? I've got two hands. But there's a lot more out there, I see. We have lots of hands doing the work. That's what we need. That's why we're studying to show ourselves approved. That's why we need to be fully persuaded in your own mind so that you're convicted and able to do the work of the ministry. By the way, we've been talking about missionaries, and a lot of times in Christianity, people talk about missionaries as if they're a different group of people. These are missionaries. They do missionary work. I'm just a Christian layman. Roman Catholic terminology. The Bible word for missionary, missionary is not a word found in your Bible. The Bible word for missionary is ambassador. People ask me if I donate to or support missionaries. I'm like, well, we're called grace ambassadors. We're trying to create them, actually. That ambassador is something that Paul called himself. He says, we're ambassadors to the Lord. Why do he call himself an ambassador? Because everyone saved in the body of Christ is in a foreign territory. We do not build the kingdom on the earth. We are from heavenly places, preaching a heavenly gospel to the lost world. We're all missionaries. We just happen to congregate together to be a people of like minds every now and then. It's called an assembly. <laughs> right? But we're all missionaries. We're all ambassadors. And the biblical pattern, by the way, for missionary duties, for ambassadorship function, is Paul. Period. So, well, look what Joshua did. You know, look what Noah did. You know, what Jesus did. None of them did missionary work in the sense Paul was. None of them were ambassadors on the earth. They were all citizens of an earthly kingdom trying to bring in the kingdom under a law system. Paul operated under grace. Paul was an ambassador sent out to the Gentiles. Every day of Paul's life, he was an ambassador to people who were never given salvation to begin with, the Gentiles. Everything he did was a missionary. You want to hear how a missionary talks? Read Paul's epistles. That's how he talks. And you know what he tells those people he ministers to? Paul creates missionaries from the people he missions to. <laughs> he goes to Ephesus, he goes to Corinth, he goes to Philippi, and he plucks people out and says, you're going to be a teacher and you're going to be an elder. Right? You think, well, that's Paul starting churches. 
That's Paul the missionary, yes, creating churches and then telling them to go teach other people. Paul's missionary activity creates missionaries. Second Timothy, look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. You're not following me yet. The function of an assembly. The origin of an assembly starts with one person. One person. Then two. Then three. May take some time. We keep quoting Hudson Taylor. You know, Hudson Taylor also said another place, the three most important attributes of a missionary is patience. Patience and patience. You wait, wait, you wait. You do work, and you wait, you do work, and you wait. And you have two people, you have three people, you have four people, and eventually you, you get more people. The Second Timothy 2, verse 2, Paul says that he would that Timothy, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This is the function of an assembly. You've got faithful men, Paul being the faithful man, who taught Timothy to be faithful, to also teach other people to be faithful. And you've got this ministry now of people creating other people to teach other people to teach other people. Right? That's missionary activity. It's not that you try to get the largest crowd you can and you have a super Christian in the front doing everyone's service. We're trying to create other people to be teachers. You should be able to teach. You should be able to be a missionary. So when a missionary comes and asks you for money, you should be able to sit right down with them and say, hey, I am too. What are you doing? What message are you preaching? What sort of work are you doing down there? Oh, it's missionary work. Yeah, yeah, I know. Me too. I read Paul's epistles. We're all doing the same work, folks. They're asking for your help with it. Timothy 2, verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him that chose him to be a soldier. Paul was thrown in prison for what he was preaching. Paul was the North Korean. You're reading the epistles from the North Korean. <laughs> and he's saying, do the work. He says, to die is gain, is what he says. You don't read epistles like this from modern church. It's, di it's different. You know, how you attract people, how you create churches, how you church plant. Very different methods than the way Paul used but Paul's methods are the pattern for us. Philippians 4, verse 17. Paul pulled his funding, his support. Of course, Paul was a tent maker. Everyone knows that. And he says in 2 Thessalonians 3 that he provided with his own hands so that he would not be chargeable to anybody. But uh, there were people who wanted to give him money anyway because they purposed in their hearts. And they said, Paul, we want to help you with this because we know that you, you work at it and you do a good work. Philippians 4, verse 17. And he says, For even in Thessalonica ye sent once again into my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that ye may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. That's the place of giving. You say, well, should we not give money to anybody? Of course not. You, you give as a purpose in your heart. You, you give generously. But Paul wants it to be a product of of your maturity, not a product of your feeling obligated to give money. Your obligation should be the burden to do ministry work. Money, disregard it. Okay. But if part of your growth, part of your maturity is to help Paul out, then hey, that's what happens. But Paul gets his support from the mission field. Notice he's teaching, he's, he's talking to the Philippians, who he was the missionary. He was the ambassador to Philippi. He gets them saved, starts an assembly, and they provide for him. What is happening in these missionary fields where missionaries constantly come back home and get money? Why aren't the people there? Well, they're all poor people. How much money do you... Then why are you... The, you're a poor person too. They're ministering among poor people. But some missionaries live as kings. Like the Corinthians. Not all. There are good ones. Every young saint is called to be a missionary, but you know, not all young saints are ready yet to be missionaries. Okay? If you look at 1 Timothy 1, verse 3, there are two battles that missionaries need to fight. There are two battles that you fight. Two battles of the ambassadors. One from the outside, one from the inside. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, the battle from the outside is with wrong doctrine. Paul says, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. Ephesus was a foreign country when I went to Macedonia, another foreign country, that thou mightest charge them that they teach no other doctrine. It says, number one battle to fight in missionary field is doctrine. Well, we're just trying to get people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a doctrine. He says, teach no other doctrine except for his gospel. Doctrine is eminently important for missionaries. Titus chapter 1, verse 5, Paul says the same thing to him, where he tells Titus to ordain elders. And those elders ought to know right doctrine. For this cause, let thy thee in Crete, another foreign country, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I appointed thee. And he goes on to explain, 
In verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. When you perform missionary work, perform ambassador work, the missionary, the elders the missionary ordains, and the people the missionary teaches ought to know right doctrine. If they don't, and you're just trying to expose people to American culture, that's wrong. You see? There's doctrine that needs to be communicated. These people need to grow in so that they also can be missionaries to other people. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5 talks about our battle and how the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. What do you call a gold coin? <laughs> carnal. <laughs> That's what that is. Ain't spiritual at all. You did hard work with your hands and then you got some money, not gold coins anymore, a piece of paper. You get a piece of paper, you take the piece of paper and you give it to someone else for exchange for other physical things. Souls are not saved with money, as Hudson Taylor so eloquently said. They're saved with people doing work. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal and are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and brings into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. It takes no money to take captive thoughts. It takes no weapons. It takes no political systems to, to take the things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God and cast them down. It takes nothing. It takes people who are equipped in right doctrine, which means study, which means you being prepared, you reading the scripture, rightly divided. Doctrine is important, and it's the number one battle from the outside that we must fight as ambassadors. The second battle is on the inside. It's with yourself. You're your own worst enemy, people have said. It's because there's your flesh right there. And whenever you feel a little tinge of suffering or pain or guilt or obligation, you say, I don't want it. I don't like that feeling. It's a duty. I don't want that duty. We're under grace, remember? It's a spiritual battle from the inside. 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, Paul says, Endure hardness as a good soldier. Right? He that warreth does not entangle himself with the affairs of this world. Just let that percolate for a while. What does that mean? Because you have a ministry that's not of this world. Galatians 5, 17 says, The spirit lusts against the flesh, and the flesh against the spirit. There's a battle within yourself. And we all admit the reason why we don't do ministry work the way we should or when we should is because of our flesh. That's how it is. We have pleasure doing other things. Right? Hudson Taylor, once again, he says, It will not do to say that you have no special call to go to China. With these facts before you and with the command of the Lord Jesus to go and preach the gospel to every creature, you need rather to ascertain whether you have a special call to stay at home. <laughs> How's that for flipping the coin around? <laughs> Whoo! It's hard stuff. But it's true. You read the verses. Don't you believe the verses? Don't you know the verses? Do you think that you're an ambassador to Jesus Christ? Do you know that you've been given the, the task of doing ministry of reconciliation? Then what's your excuse for not doing it? You don't sit around and go, well, God hasn't called me to be a missionary. He hasn't called me to be a preacher. He hasn't called me to minister. He's told us all to be members of the body of Christ to minister. So that's what Hudson Taylor said. And that's what he, he used to appeal. And I quote him so often just because uh, I finished reading his biography, number one. But number two is that uh, he had a heart. Okay, He didn't rightly divide. His prayer doctrine was horrendous. But you know what? There were people, there was a time where people had the heart. They had the inner spirituality. They would sacrifice the physical for the spiritual. They thought about the condition of humanity, and they wanted to do work. And sometimes in modern Christianity, where we have so much information and access with our hands, we increase in knowledge, 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 and it puffs us up. We forget that, hey, we need a heart to do something. Sometimes we have work to do. In every Pauline assembly, every member of the body of Christ, we're a mission agency, it's what we are. We are trying to equip and create missionaries, ambassadors for Christ. And when members grow, there's a time when you're not ready yet. And so we come here and we grow and we edify each other. But when you're ready and when you grow and you come to knowledge of the truth, you need to start working on your heart, on that purpose inside and saying, what, what do I need to do? Where can I fill in? What, where can I supply where there's lacking? Okay. And when you have the knowledge and you're growing your spiritual life, you understand the doctrines, you're equipped to do that. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is profitable, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good work. Right? The good works that God has ordained. So 2 Timothy 4, verse 5, he tells Timothy, One who was facing that battle in his flesh, between the flesh and the spirit, who was ashamed of the teaching. And that's something we all have to grow and we all have to struggle with. Don't we all, aren't we all a little timid? On exposing what we believe. 2 Timothy 4, verse 5. 
Paul says, uh, watch thou the things, watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So there's a command here. Endure afflictions, make full proof, do the work. Right? So people don't like me, they oppose me, they they get offended when I say something. It's very small, folks, it's very small afflictions there. Do it do it in love, do it in gentleness. We need to expose people to the kind of desire that God's grace creates in souls that he saves. Right? And that's how we respond to charities and missionaries. That's how we do ministry work. We become the charitable person. We become the missionary. And when we see where God's work is being done, we help that out too. But it doesn't relieve us of our own obligation. Okay? If I support others, it's to help them with their duty. It's not to relieve yourself of your own. So we grow in the knowledge of the truth, seeing the soul saved. Our money has a place. Our time has a better place. Our hands are needed. Okay? Money wrongly placed and money given with the wrong motives are both, both things that we should avoid. And so it's not just about money. And that's kind of the, the subtitle of today's lesson, isn't it? Need less money, more work. Hope that was encouraging. Uh, any thoughts or questions about that? Yes? I like this lesson. Thank you. <laughs> My wife. <laughs> what you, what I paid her for that. Yeah. You love this lesson? Yeah, I like this lesson. And, well, I want to say, like, Taylor Hartson, he's a go-getter. He, he knows that he, he do his do ministry, then he do it no matter what the circumstance was. And, but I think um, there's something to, to be careful because he know he's not bold to do ministry because he he thinks that God provided everything for him. Mm-hmm. So he's he's a, I'm going to do this. If mm-hmm. I'm poor, God will provide yeah. me. And you know, in America, if you use Taylor Hardison as an example, it's good because American ministry they pursue comfort, comfort ministry. So you use Hardison as like do it no matter what, no matter what circumstance. But in China, when you use Har- Taylor Hardison, you need to be careful because a lot of Chinese preachers, they know Hardison and they set it as an example that mm-hmm. they will do it even they are poor and because God will provide me. Yeah, well, and that, that was the prayer part. She's calling me out here. See, this is a good example. She, yeah. she must have read yeah. the book too. She's read the book too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, his prayer life was horrendous. And like I said, you know, his, his doctor on prayer, and he intentionally would uh, invoke poverty on himself, uh, trying to test the doctrine of prayer, saying God will provide for me. So he intentionally did not tell anybody about his need. He intentionally didn't try to work. He just sat in a poorhouse with one coin lap and saying, well, God's going to give me something. Yeah. And by some chance it happened. Same thing happened with George Mueller. If you ever read the story of George Mueller, uh, he's often touted as the hero of the faith and prayer because he did the same thing. He never asked anybody for money, and yet he ran how many orphanages, you know, and, and charities, and because people gave him money because they hear his story and all that. Um, but not everybody can do that. It's not God giving them that money. It's people giving them that money when they hear their story. And if everybody tried to do that, a lot of people do that, try that, and they fail miserably, and they don't get money provided, and they end up in the poorhouse in, in charity from the other Christians. So, so I think, like, yeah. like what? Like, I think Paul is the perfect example because they say, like, if mm-hmm. any man don't work, yep. he should not eat. So he's, yep. he, he is more sound doctrine grounded. So he knows <laughs> Most that, definitely. Well, yeah. Yeah, Paul so said he, he would, he he would spend and be spent, and at the same time, he, he worked. Yeah. yeah. So he is definitely the, the better pattern than even Hudson Taylor. So, excellent. Thank you. Any other comments? All right. Lord, we thank you so much for your, your word and the privilege we have to do your work here on earth. I pray that we would feel the burden to do that work and that we would be courageous. To-